he is overcome. Amen. Let me know he's an overcoming God. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning as we honor our offering today? How many believe it's the word of God is true? You really believe it's true? Then we also can believe the word says, if you give, it shall be given. So, Father, we thank you for a time of giving today. We give you glory and praise, a time to sow a seed. Lord, and Father, we thank you that in this day and hour, Father, we give you praise because of the opportunity of working and giving us health to bring forth the tithe through the storehouse. So, Father, we give you thanks now. We pray a 30, 60, and 100 fold return over it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 While you're standing, go around and find somebody shaking and tell them you love them this morning. Come on. Just go over and tell them you love them this morning. Would you do that? Come on. Just go tell them, hug them, give them a hug this morning. Say, I love you this morning in Jesus' name. <coughs> Come on, just say, I'm so glad you're here today in Jesus' name. Woo, this is a day that the Lord has made. Good morning. How you doing? You know, hallelujah. You know, if you're, if you're from up north, somewhere around uh, New York or something, say, how you doing? Well, how, you, how you doing? You, know, you, you got you to get that head moving and it's just how you doing, you know. So good to have you today. It's good. Blessing, blessing, blessing. Let me go ahead and dismiss the children this morning in Jesus' name. Get our kids back there. See you, bud. Give me a high five, low five. Oh, oh, not him. There you go. There you go, right there. All right. See you, see you shortly, bud. Yeah. Go get him, brother. Go get him. Okay. Oh, oh, he's back, he said. Okay. All right. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Glory to God, our teachers and kids. We love and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, this is the day everybody say, that the Lord has made. So so good to have you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we're going to have an incredible word for you today. Uh, Josh Fives is going to be ministering, which is also our worship leader, but uh, he's also a son. And so, uh, we, you know, sons and daughters have a lot of those around. And so we bless them and we speak life over them. And so we're believing that the Word of God can come through any vessel. Uh, Josh has been faithful. He's been available. He's been teachable. Uh, and that's what it takes to really build the kingdom of God. We call it the fat principle. Not, not this, okay? But being faithful, being available, and being teachable. You know, I've learned through the years of ministry over 30-something years is the fact, full-time-wise, if you're those three things, you can go high as you want to in God. Because you can be faithful and not be available. So you can be teachable but not faithful. And so, but you had all three working together for good. And so Josh has done that uh, and continue to do that and worshiping and building a worship team. And so we're building the, the uh, worship uh, uh, stage over there. And as we're building it, uh, it's, it's about three times this long, okay? Uh, because he, he told me, uh, so, you know, when Josh tells you something, you have to just honor the word out of him. <laughs> That he said that I'm, I'm going to triple the worship team. So, so we need to triple the stage, right? Yeah, come on, stand. Won't you just bless Josh this morning in Jesus' name? Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Even though I've been up, on, I was on stage already. But good morning again. You know. Oh man, it's a, good to be here as always, as per usual. When Pastor was like, yeah, when Josh tells you something, you just got to, I'm like, you're the only person that's ever, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm excited uh, to be here, I'm obviously, and I'm excited to be speaking today. I always say that I love preaching because I love to talk, and you got to listen to me, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that just, uh, I, I, was, I was, it's funny, like a couple of weeks ago when Pastor had asked me to preach, um, I had already been uh, having this word on my heart that I just wanted to share. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, um, it's kind of going along with the, uh, uh, with kind of what Pastor's been talking about, inheritance, uh, in a sense. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I was like, hey, that's cool. Actually, like two weeks ago, whenever he started speaking on it, he was saying some of the things that I'm going to mention today. And I'm in the back with Billy, and I'm like, he's taking my sermon. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> so I was like, now I got to come up with something else. But, uh, yeah, so uh, today's a cool day. Um, so if, if, uh, we didn't do a proper intro, but my buddy Eli Simon uh, was leading worship with us today. <laughs> Welcome him. He is an old friend from CFNI when I was at Christ for the Nations Institute. Uh, we met there and just uh, stayed connected ever since. Uh, he's here with his wife, Caroline. She's from Brazil. So, so all the 
Anybody's watching in Brazil? Bom dia. Eu falo um pouco de português. Um, and then uh, my buddy, actually, Michael Lombardo, he's here. Raise your hand, Michael. Um, he's a good friend. He's also a friend from CFNI uh, that we met years ago. We used to actually go to my previous, previous church before I was here. Uh, we were uh, we met there, and we became friends and just stayed in touch. And um, he uh, actually, uh, small world, uh, he has a he does a Facebook Live video uh, 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 show where he interviews uh, different ministers and everything like that. And Pastor Sandy was actually on his show a few, was it a month or two ago, right? Something like that? Three ago. About three months ago. So, yeah, so it's a small world, you know. And uh, actually, his spiritual mom is really good friends with Pastor Sandy, who will be here in two weeks, two weeks. So, yeah, small world, you know. It's, it's, it's cool how the, the funny thing is, is the more and more I get into ministry, the smaller and smaller the world gets. And then I'm like, oh, man, I better be careful. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, let's get started today. Um, there was a there was a uh, there was a man who was, who was preaching and he had a bunch of ministers behind him in the choir, and uh, he was like, "I'm not going to preach long today." And so he preached for about 30 minutes, and every every time he said something good, the people said, "Amen," and everybody's just getting it. And then about an hour later, people are like, "Amen," okay, and then two hours later, "Amen," you know, people are falling asleep, and so finally, whenever three hours later, somebody in the front just grabs a hymnal and just throws it at him. And then he, it misses him and hits somebody in the back. And the guy in the back says, hit me again. I still hear him preaching. So I'll try, I'll try to get us out early today. So don't throw hymnals at me. We don't have hymnals, so it's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I want to talk today about the title of my sermon is going to be called Giant Men, Giant Walls, Giant Waves, Gigantic God. Giant Men, Giant Walls, Giant Waves, Gigantic God. And... Um, so before that, let's turn to Matthew 9:35. Well, actually, just Matthew 9. Yeah, Matthew 9, verse 35 through 38. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 38. And I'm just going to read very quickly through here. I'm reading out of the uh, New King James Version. Let's see here. Where am I at? Here we go. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read it, up and y'all can catch along. Uh, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Lord God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak to your people, Lord God. Lord, I thank you um, because you are just so merciful, God, and you are graceful, God. And I thank you because uh, we believe, Lord, that you are on the move and you are doing something, Lord God, that the harvest truly is plentiful, God, and you are preparing each and every single one of us to go and reap that harvest, Lord God. Lord, I just thank you. I bless everyone here. I bless everyone watching on live stream today. And uh, bless this word, Lord, that it be your words through your Holy Spirit and not mine, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I believe that the church is in a preparation phase for the next move of God. And what I mean by the church, I'm not just talking about us here at LifeGate Church. I'm talking about the church in general. Now, here at our church, we're doing great things. We're moving forward, all that good stuff. We're uh, having the building built and everything like that. It's just really cool to go see that going on. I remember, uh, if y'all remember, for those of y'all... Uh, a few months ago, Pastor had said um, that he got a word at the very beginning of 2018. And he said the first six months is going to be just a time of trials, a time of just tribulations, a time of just pressing through. And then after month six, it will be breakthrough season. And that was in July. And that, that could be breakthrough in many areas. It can be in healing. It can be financial provision. It can be uh, for us. Actually, that's when things started moving with our new building. Uh, it, it's crazy how, how that was happening. And so... Um, I don't think it's coincidence that us as a church here that we're moving in through the next into the next phase of our you know existence here, but also the church in general. Um, I have many friends uh, that I've met over Steve and I, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, that are doing awesome things for God. One of my friends, uh, his name is Daniel Salame. He's actually uh, in uh, in the Middle East, and uh, he. Um, is an amazing, amazing man of God. Um, every time he comes into town, um, I always talk to him. I'm like, yo, man, so, like, what's going on? He's like, 
oh, well, like, uh, this two guys' eyeballs grew back. Uh, one guy, uh, he didn't have an eardrum, and his eardrum just popped out. Uh, one guy's leg literally just grew out. Like, I mean, just amazing miracles and moves of God. And I'm just like, God, why not me? You know, like, I want to see that, you know. Uh, you know, in, in Brazil, there's people getting saved in the droves. I mean, the amazing, everywhere in South America, this, the, the way that people are getting saved. I mean, God is doing something today in the earth. If you're not aware, God is doing something in the world today. And so I started, I started thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, God, I see that you I see my friends. Obviously, it's not something that's secondhand. I'm seeing this. My friends are posting on Facebook. Friends are calling me. Friends are texting me. I'm, I'm seeing all these things. And I'm like, what's going on here? What's happening here? And I'm like, God, what is it? And I asked myself, what is holding us back? And I'd, I'd, I'd have to say that it's probably doubt and unbelief. And the reason I say that is because of negativity amongst Christians about the state of the world today. About the state of the, let's just put it, let's just narrow it down to the United States today. Um, I hear many people uh, not all, but I hear people just saying, man, this country is just bad. This, this is just going to hell in a handbasket. Jesus is coming soon. We got to get out of here. We just got to, you know, oh, man, I can't wait for him to come back. And when, as, as Christians are looking for the exit, I'm thinking, why are we looking for the exit? We need to be getting things prepared. When Jesus had said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So the ones that are looking for the exit are the ones that are not wanting to go and reap the harvest. Jesus had even said, he told the disciples, you're going to do everything that I did and even greater things than what I did. I mean, it's written down for us. I mean, if you don't know, this is... I mean, it, it said it right there. I didn't say it. He did. But yet we still doubt. Yet we still kind of like, oh, you know, that's maybe. I don't know. But I bet you if I handed you a check for $10,000, you wouldn't doubt that right there. When we get a check, you believe that you have that cash in your hand. It's just a piece of paper. It's not good until you go and take it to the bank. And I believe that it's time that we cash in on what God has in store for us. So I want to I want I want to talk about uh, three different instances: uh, giant men, giant walls, and giant waves. Gigantic God. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in Numbers 13, if you go to Numbers 13, uh, it, it show, it's talking about where Moses sends out the 12 spies. Okay, uh, Moses sends out the 12 spies to go check out Canaan and everything. Uh, they're all leaders. Uh, every single one of them is a leader in their tribe of the 12 tribes of of Israel, and so they all go in to do some recon. Reconnaissance. If you don't know what that is, basically they're incognito. They're kind of going, hiding, kind of checking everything out. Military terms, they go and check it out and scope out what's going on and everything, get information, and come back to their command, and they tell them what's going on. So they go and they do that. It says that they were there for 40 days checking it out. And it says that they had, they cut down this big branch of these humongous fruits. I like to think they're grapes. They're probably like big old grapes like this big. I'd be like, yes, I want that. I love grapes, by the way. Grapes are so good. Um, and they come and they bring it back and they're like, dang, check out these fruits, man. They're crazy huge. And so finally when they come back, all 12 of them come back. And you got 10 guys that have a negative report, that are pessimistic about it. And then you got two guys that are positive and optimistic. So the 10 come back and they, they report to, to Moses and to all, all of the leadership. They're like, man. Look at this fruit. It is crazy. Look at all this fruit. But they got giants over there. There's the, 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 the sons of, of Amalek, they're there, and they're going to kill us, and they're going to eat us. I mean, they're huge. We're tiny. I mean, I'm about like five foot five, you know. Yeah. And, oh, and on top of that, they got these cities that are really, really big and strong, and we can't break through. I mean, we don't got any kind of... I mean, yeah, you should go see those cities. They're huge. The grapes are huge. The grapes are great, but so are the people. And they're just being real negative about it. And then Caleb's like, yo, let's go. Like, let's get out of here. Let's go get that. And all the other guys are like, no, you're crazy. Sit down. We can't win. No. And then those 10 people, those 10 guys, finally, you know, those 10 people went out 
to back to their tribes and everything, and they told their people. They were like, "Yeah, we went, but we can't. We can't get. We can't win. We're 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 small in number, man. Like they got giants over there. I saw one guy had like four arms. Like, I mean, you know, I saw another guy. Another guy had like six toes. I'm like, dude, that's gross, man. I'm not even. I'm not even trying to go over there. I mean, I, I saw a guy, he had a sword that was like, you know, so it was like five feet long, just a blade, not including, I mean, he's gonna chop off like six heads, like just one stroke, man. Like it just, we can't do it, man. And then Caleb is going back to his tribe and he's like, guys, okay, look, yeah, they got giants over there, but we can do this, like we got this. And then you got Joshua in his tribe, he's like, he, it says Joshua was a son of none. He's telling dad, he's like, dad, you should go check out this place over there. Like, there's a little bit of work that we got to do. We got to, like, exterminate some people. But, you know, they're, like, sons of giants. But, you know, we got this. Like, we can do this, you know? So the, the negative people that were going back, they were, like, it says in the Bible that they went and all of Israel started crying. And all of Israel started getting in travail. And all of Israel was like, oh, my God, we can't do it. Why did we come out here? We should have just gone back to for the Egypt. And we're out here. We're just going to die. God, why? Oh, I don't know why. Like, it just says that there are. And then, and, then, and then the Joshua and Caleb were like, hang on, hang on, guys. Hang on. Chill, 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 chill. Like, we can do this. We can, yeah, they got giants, and yeah, they got big cities, but we can do this. God says that the, the land really is flowing with milk and honey. It truly is the promised land. We got to take some people out, but it truly is. And it says, it says, if God delights in us, then he's going to give us that land. He already said it for us. And then the negative people were like, wait a minute, no, 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 you just want us to go get killed. You know what? Let's kill them instead. And then it says, you know what, grab a stone. We're going to stone these guys. They're like, okay. And Josh and Caleb were like, let's get out of here. Forget them. Let's go. So they jetted out of there. <laughs> Josh and Caleb try again because they know the promise, and yet they get threatened. Sometimes even your fellow Christians will try to stone you with their own doubt and unbelief. <laughs> This world, they're saying this world is too far gone to be redeemed. This world is too far gone. The, 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 this generation, uh, the next generation, they're just, all they care about is being on the computer and being on their phones. And all, all, they, all, they, all they care about is, you know, whatever. You got, you got kids thinking that they're the opposite gender. You got, you know, men wanting to sleep with little boys. Like, all, like this country is just too far gone. This world is too far gone. But you need to learn to separate yourself from the negativity. Later on, we see, we see that God is telling Moses. We see, we see Moses, uh, God, he's, Moses is like, man, so what are we supposed to do? Uh, God, you know, we got some issues over here. But you said, and then only Joshua and Caleb, though, God said, you know what? Those ten leaders and their tribes, they ain't going to see it. They ain't going to see it. You know why? Because they doubted me. Because they do not want to push through they don't want to press through, even though I had already said it. I already said it. And yet they don't want to, they don't want to go through. Except for Caleb. Because he is of a different spirit. Some translations say he was of a different mindset. Some translations say that because he was of a different attitude. It's, it's, it's funny how God is about your mindset and your attitude. Hmm. And then he says, and of course, Joshua, because he was following Moses. So he says, none of them are going to go see it except for Joshua and Caleb. Because he was of a, they were a different mindset, different attitude. And he says, except for Joshua and Caleb because he was a different mindset and because he followed me fully. Some translations say because he had faith in me. Other people may be doubting that another move of God is going to happen. Other people may doubt and, and, and think, you know, this world is too far gone. But Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for another move of God. I'm, I, I believe that there is something that is going to happen. We're going to see signs and wonders and miracles. We're going, not, not just healings physically in the body and, and, and miraculous wonders, but we're going to see amazing things taking place in marketplace. We're going to see amazing things taking place in schools. We're going to see things taking place in the government realms. I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going to see it. Later on in the book of Joshua, Moses has already been dead. Sorry, Moses, you old, you dead. 
And so Joshua's in charge now. Not me, but I like the name. Joshua's in charge now. In Joshua, in, the, in, in chapter 6, uh, it's talking about uh, the walls of Jericho. They're already in the land, and they're taking over. They're doing their thing. But then there's this big, huge city with walls and, and armies and all this stuff. And they're like, dude, what are we going to do? And Joshua's like, let me go talk to God real quick. I'll be right back. And he's like, God, what are we supposed to do? And then God tells him, all right, here's what you're going to do. You ready? All right. You're going to march around the city six times. Okay. Okay, cool, God. All right, you're going to march around six times, but you got to be quiet, though. We got to be quiet. Okay. So who do you want me to take? Take the priests, take the altar, take your leaders. Going to go march around the property or march around the Jericho. Okay. But you want us to be quiet, right? Because I got this dude that is with me, and he talks all the time. (laughs) Tell them to be quiet. But I like to talk to I said be quiet. All right, God, you got it. And, on the, and then what do we do after that? I'll tell you after you do the six times. So they go and they march around. And I can just imagine them just walking, not saying a word. And then one guy's probably like, dude, what are we doing? Shh, God said us do it in silence. You know what I mean? You always have that one guy. I was that one kid in school. <laughs> My cousin Abraham is here and he's like, yeah, I know. I was that one kid in school uh, when they say, let's play the quiet game. I'm like, let's see who, who's going to lose. And I'm like, I lost. That's me. That was me. And they march around in silence. And then and, and I start, I, when I started looking at this, I was, I was thinking to myself, why in silence, though? Why is it that sometimes, like, it's, it's weird. You would think that you would think that if they were if they were an if they had an army i mean they did have an army but you would think most of the time an army what they're going to do is they're going to bang their drums boom 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 and they're going to make a bunch of noise sound bigger than what they are you know that kind of situation kind of like the whole gideon thing they're like oh like gideon you know where it was only 300 of them and they're like ah you know they shouted real loud and they confused it you know they're probably thinking why are we being quiet though like we got a full army like why are we doing this and i started thinking to myself why in silence because you see, the size of their problem was evident. Obviously, it says that the wall was like 15 to 16 feet high, and at the highest point was 40 feet high. The walls were six feet thick, like six feet. That's a, that's a really like hard wall, you know. And imagine—I mean, just picture this. Imagine just a group of men marching around a city. Let's just say the size of Hearst. We're in Hearst, marching around in silence. And the people are, the soldiers are up on the wall, and they're probably like, what are they doing? They're not even, like, attacking. This is, what are they doing? You see, the size of their problem was evident. And the walking around, marching around the city, marching around these walls may not have seemed productive. But I'd like to think sometimes that God told them to be quiet because their thoughts did not become words. The only word that was spoken was when God said, the city is yours. I just need you to go walk around it. Sometimes we just need to shut up. I'm just saying. Because our own words can deceive us. Your own words, when you start saying things like, oh, I I can't apply for that job. I'm not qualified for that job. Rather than saying, God, you, you said that whatever the heel of my foot touches shall be mine. So if I walk in that job and declare it, God, I want this job. If you want me to have this job, I'm going to have this job. Or, you know what? No, I, uh, that, he, God can't heal that person. He can heal a headache, but I don't know if he can heal that huge tumor growing out the side of their head. Your words, the Bible says that the, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And imagine if, if these men, if God had not told them to be quiet, and these men were marching around, and they were saying, dude, look how huge this wall is, man. Oh, I know, man. Like, how are we supposed to, 
We can't even scale that. Like, how are we supposed to do? What are we doing out here? You know what? Let's just go, dude. Let's just turn around. Like, uh uh-uh. Imagine if that was their mindset. I like to think that they didn't even talk about it beforehand. I like to think that Joshua said, hey, God said, march in silence. Let's go. And nobody questioned about it. Regardless if some of them were thinking, dude, this is going this, this is gonna be bad. We're gonna die. Regardless of what they were thinking, this is gonna be terrible. Oh, this isn't gonna work. And some of the guys were probably thinking, dude, this is gonna be cool. I'm so excited to see what God's gonna do. I can imagine Caleb like being there. He's like, oh man, this is gonna be cool. I'm so excited. What's gonna happen? And Joshua was like, I'm trusting you, God. You, you got this. They're thinking all these things, but their words did not become evident because all they knew in that once, because they're all thinking, they all thought, one guy may be thinking, this isn't going to work. One guy may be thinking, this is going to work. The other guy may be thinking, oh, let's see what happens. But they're all thinking, okay, I'm following that guy. Like, he obviously, he obviously thinks it's going to work. They were in one mindset, one accord. Regardless of what their individual thoughts were, their one mindset was going to break them through. The other, the other thing that I, what I was thinking, what, what brought to, what came to my attention was the enemy did not know what they were thinking. The enemy did not know what they were saying. There are times when the devil's going to throw things at you, and he's going to think, okay, now, now, okay, this this is definitely going to make them say something. Oh, this is definitely going to make them trip up. But when you stay silent, I can just imagine all of the, 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 the people in Jericho, when they're looking, they're like, what are they doing? Why are they quiet? Dude, this is weird. They got some kind of plan. They're going to kill us. Oh, my. What is happening? And they all started freaking out because of their silence. Later on, once the, we know that the walls came down, later on, they, 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 you, they, they were told, we were in fear of you. The devil doesn't know your thoughts, but he can hear your words and use them against you. Your silence can drive the enemy crazy. The Israelites knew that that this was bigger than what they could handle. But God had the final word. God said, on the seventh time around, you're going to shout as loud as you can. You're going to probably blow your vocal cords. And you're going to blast these ram horns. And they're going to be really loud, these shofars. And those walls are going to come down. I just want to ask you today, what is your Jericho today? What is your giant today? Don't dwell on the bigness of the walls. Do not dwell on the bigness of the giant. Because don't dwell on the, on, the, on the bigness of that mountain. Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to be uprooted and be cast into the sea. It only takes a small little portion. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and God accounted him to righteousness. So therefore, it's not a matter of how big the problem is, how big the mountain is. A lot of times we just need to stop telling God how big this mountain is and start telling the mountain how big and gigantic your God is. Mm. Going back to the mountains, I want to go back really quick. Later on uh, in uh, Samuel, we see David, obviously, giant killer. He's a beast. Love it. He's great. And so David is a shepherd boy, right? He's out there doing his thing, taking care of the sheep. Playing his little layer. And he's out there doing his shepherdly duties, all that good stuff. And then he goes down to the, he knows that the Philistines are there and he's gonna go and his brothers are down there and they're like, dude, why is nobody fighting? The Bible says that they were on one side of the mountain and that the Philistines were on another mountain and they're just talking smack back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Ah, we're gonna kill you. Ah, but nobody's fighting. They're all just, just, ah. And then that this big dude that's like nine to ten feet tall comes out, and he's like, hey, I'm Goliath, and I'm going to kill y'all. Uh, I defy your gods, all this stuff. And so David comes out, and he sees this giant. And he's like, wow, okay, why is nobody fighting this guy? And the thing that was cool is like, it was interesting is David had all three of the former problems that I just mentioned. David had a giant problem. David had a wall of soldiers behind him. 
and David had negativity behind him. You know? He had all three of the former mentioned problems, a giant in front of him, a wall of soldiers, and negativity from his own people. And so he's like, what's going on with this guy? And so he says, the people are telling him, well, the king had said like two days ago, three days, a week ago, however, I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But he had said, whoever kills him, their family's not going to pay taxes no more. They'll be rich. Uh, they get to marry his daughter. And David's like, wait, say that again? He got to marry his daughter? What? <laughs> she, she hot too. I know, huh? And so David was like, okay, so you're telling me you're telling me that he said, what now? David had to hear it again. He had to hear it again. He's like, tell me one more time what he said. And so he goes to the king and he tells, he, he tells King Saul, hey, Saul, uh, I'm going to go fight this dude. Um, they told me that if I kill this guy, I get to marry your daughter. Yeah, you get to pay taxes. Yeah, but I get to marry your daughter, though. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> David had to hear the word. Three times, he said, hold on, you're telling me if I just kill this dude, I don't even got to take out the army. I just got to kill that dude? Hmm. All right, cool. And so David goes out there, and we all know what happens. He had the five little, five smooth stones, and he, blam, slayed him, all that stuff. Goliath falls, dead, goes and grabs his own sword, chops his head off, Done. He was, the, he was a giant killer. Yes, it was obvious that he was a huge man. Yes, it was obvious that there was a huge wall of Philistine soldiers behind him. And yeah, his people back here were talking negative stuff. But all he held on to was the word. Whenever we have these issues in our lives, when you have a huge wall of debt, when you have a huge giant of sickness and infirmity, when you have people just talking negative things that, no, you're never going to get out of debt, or, oh, man, I'm never going to find a job, whatever it may be, you remember what the word of God says, where he says that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, that I am first, not last, that I am a victor, no longer a victim, that I am the head, that I'm not the tail. I re rely on the word of what he said. Later on in 2 Samuel, we see that his men, even his men, were giant killers. Later on, it says that, that David was kind of sick. He was feeling kind of down, and that one giant came after him. He was going to kill him, but one of his boys came up, and he was like, nope, you thought, and then he killed him. <laughs> and he said, hey, look, David King, like, you're a beast and all, but you're not going to fight no more because you got to continue the lineage of the crown of Israel. So you're not going to fight. Let your boys take care of it. We got this. All right? And you go and you read, and, and, and all the different guys in this says that one guy killed a giant. Choom. And then another guy killed another giant. Ha! And then even David's little brother was like, dude, I got this. My big bro did it. I can do it too. Shoom. You look at the history. If you can say, you know what? If God did it for them, he can do it for me. If God helped me kill that giant, then I can do it too. If he came through for them in that financial situation, then I can get it too. If he healed them once, he can do it again. I've seen you move, God, and I believe that I'm going to see you again. Turn to somebody and tell him he's going to do it one more time. He's going to do it again. <sighs> Later in, in Matthew, going back to Matthew, gigantic waves. Later on, we see that the dis disciples and Jesus are out on the boat. <laughs> and uh, this big, huge storm started coming. And Jesus is asleep. <laughs> I can just see all the guys. It says that they're on a little boat. And I can just see all the disciples. You know, some of them are skilled sailors because some of them are fishermen, you know. I see. And they're out on this boat, and they're trying to, you know, try to keep from getting the boat to topple over. And then you got Jesus as he was sleeping in the stern, just sleeping. Can you imagine Jesus? I could just see him. He's probably having a dream, thinking like, man, watching like a thousand years. They're going to make like a bed out of water, just like this. 
It's going to be a waterbed. Jesus, because he's Jesus, you know. He, he, he knows what's going to happen. He's like, man, watch. One of these days, they're going to make rubber and plastic, and they're going to make a bed out of water. It's going to be so cool. These guys don't even know. Like, so he's enjoying it. He's on the boat just sleeping, just chilling. And then the disciples are like, the disciples are up there going, Jesus, oh, my God, help us. We're going to die. Like, uh, dude, let me sleep, bro. Like, I'm just sleeping. Like, Peter, just, you talk too much. Just go. And then Peter's like, Jesus, do you not even care that we're dying? There's water coming in. We're going to die. Oh, my God. Oh, my you. Like, and Jesus is like, all right, I'm up now. Jesus gets up and he says, peace. I wonder if he went back to sleep. That's what I would have done if I was Jesus. I would have been like, peace, water, chill. I was enjoying that waves, but whatever. And he goes back to sleep. And then the disciples were even like, who is this man that even the waves and the winds obey him? What is going on? And I can see John be like, I told you we were going to drown. I'm going to go with Jesus. He loves me. And he goes, Jesus, I told them. I told them that, I wasn't, that we weren't going to die because you love me the most. <laughs> later on in, in, in Matthew, this is a couple of days later. Another storm comes. Another huge, gigantic wave. This time Jesus wasn't on the boat. But Jesus has said, hey, guys, go to the other side. I'll catch up to you. Don't worry about it. It's, it's funny, though, that the, that the disciples didn't question. They were like, how's he going to catch up to us? I don't, what's he going to do? Walk across the water? <laughs> yeah, right. We'll see. So they go out. And then the waves start coming. The big, huge storm happens. And they were like, oh, my God, we're going to die. Ah! And then John's like, I, yeah, this time Jesus isn't on the boat. Last time he was, I'm, I'm kind of freaking out now. He's holding on for dear life. They're like, he was on the boat last time, but he's not this time. Ah! And then Peter's like, don't worry, guys, I got this. Okay, no, I don't. Just kidding. Judas, come help me out. Hey, man, hang on. I'm trying to count money over here. And so they're like, I can just imagine them all freaking out, losing their minds. And so it says later on, you can see that they saw something out on the water, and they thought it was a ghost. They're like, oh, man, we must be dead already because I'm seeing ghosts, man. I could, I could, I picture, I picture, I picture Peter sometimes kind of talking like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, you know? He's like, like, yikes, man, we must be dead already, man, because there's a ghost out on the water, man. Oh, no, we're going to die, man. Yikes, Scoob. And, you know, it just Peter talked too much. And he's just like, dude, shut up, you know? I love Peter. He's cool. Reminds me of myself. And so they see this, this ghost figure, and they're thinking, oh, my, we're dead. All right, oh, we're so dead. And then Jesus is like, guys, chill. Peace be on y'all. It's just me. It's all good. All right, it's just me. And then Peter was like, he was on the boat. Guys, I think that's Jesus. John's like, uh, he's, he really is walking on the water. And then Matthew's like, I don't know, man. Like, my vision's not that good. Is that really Jesus? And Peter's like, no, no, that is Jesus. Hey, Jesus, if that's really you, bid me come to you. If that's really you, put out a word. And then what does Jesus say? He says, Come, C-O-M-E. And so then what's, what's interesting, it, it doesn't say that the waves stopped. The storm didn't stop. The storm was still there, but yet the word was out there. And that he says, all right, guys, I'm going to go jump out. Peter, you're the best sailor we have. What do you mean you're going to jump out on the water? It's okay, guys. If I get to Jesus, we'll be okay. All right, I'm going to jump out. And then the other guys are probably like, I'm going to see if he really is going to drown. I mean, like, man, that's, I mean, we're, might as, we're dead anyway. Might as well. Go ahead. And so then Peter steps out onto that sea, on the sea. And he, and he, he gets to 
the end of that sea. He's like, guys, look, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm walking on the water. I think that Pe I think Peter went out a few yards. He, he probably went probably a good maybe 10 yards, maybe 15 yards, maybe a little bit further out. Who knows? But he was out on the sea. He was out on the beginning of the word. And he says, guys, I'm out here. And the, the guys are on the boat. They're probably like, oh, dude, he really is doing it. He really is out there. Dude, I want to try. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. But, dude, that's so cool. And so he's out there, and he's on the sea. And he's like, guys, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And he looks around. And he's like, oh. <laughs> These waves. Oh. And then what does he see? He sees the rest of that word. It says, oh, me. And all he can think about was, oh, me, oh, my problems, oh, my waves, oh, my debt, oh, my sickness, oh, my lack of job, oh, my lack of, um, oh, my in in insufficiencies, all of my inadequacies, all of the things that I'm not qualified for. Oh, me, me. Ah. And then it says that he started sinking right in the middle of his oh. Oh. And he says, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. This word wasn't good enough. Save me. And then Jesus says, oh, you little faith. He pulls him out. Why did you doubt? Puts him back on the boat. <sighs> Do not let the waves and storms of life distract you from your word. The circumstances and waves of life do not determine your outcome. Your beliefs do. The thing you got to remember when those storms and waves hit you is who is on your boat. When you're on the boat and it's rocking back and forth and you don't know how to Brace yourself. You got water coming in from one side. You're drowning. The, the, the mast is cracking. Your sails have ripped off. And you have no idea what's going on. But you got Jesus sleeping on the back of the boat. And you can say, you know what? I don't care if this boat is going to sink because Jesus is on my boat. And if he's on the boat, it ain't going nowhere. It isn't going to be sunk because he's on the boat. And you know what? If the boat does sink, I'm going to be walking on the water because he had done it before. He saved me once and he'll do it again. He's healed me once and he will do it again. He's provided for me once, and he will do it again. Oh, Lord. God, I just pray that you help us remember that you are on the boat, that we are not going to sink no matter what people say, no matter what the world is saying, no matter what our circumstances are saying, that you are on the boat. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. The Israelites had a history with God coming through for them over and over and over again. You can read it all through Exodus. They had a cloud that kept them cool during the day and a pillar that kept them warm at night. They had manna every day. Their sandals and their clothes didn't rot for 40 years. I mean, come on. I got to go buy new shoes after three months. David had said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of the living God? The reason he said he's uncircumcised is because he did not have a covenant with God. He says, I have a covenant with God. He doesn't. Peter had the word from Jesus. He was with Jesus. Your history with God is your proof. Your salvation through Jesus is your covenant. And your written word here is your confirmation. Going back to Mark chapter 9. Once they got off the other side of that boat, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus goes and he's walking around. He's ministering to people. And a man comes up to him and says, Lord, Lord, heal my son. He's possessed by a demon, and it throws him in the fire. It throws him in the water, and is trying to kill him. And, and he says, if you, if you can, 
heal him. And then Jesus says, anything is possible to those who, who believe. And Jesus said, I mean, I'm sorry, the man says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Many times we come to God and we say, God, if you can, I need you to come through one more time. I can't pay rent. God, if you can, I need you to come through. My mom's sick again. Her, her diabetes started acting up again. God, if you can, my brother-in-law started drinking again. I need you to move on, on his behalf. If you can. We come with this, this doubt and we just say, God, if, if, if you can, if you want to. The Bible never says that Jesus didn't want to heal anyone. It never says that he didn't want to do things for people. Actually, in some parts of the Bible, it says that he could not perform miracles because of their unbelief and doubt. But when we come to him and we say, God, if you can, even though the word says, surely, in good, surely goodness and mercy will follow me every day of my life. That you are put, put, pulling through for me. You're coming through all the time. Lord, that you know the plans and the thoughts that you have for me. The things that you have in store, they're all nothing but good things. And yet we still come and we say, if you can. God, this, this world is just going to hell in a handbasket. If you can, move. If you can. And the other half of that is when he says, God, I believe you, but help my unbelief. Recently, I, I've, I've found myself in that situation where I, I said, God, I believe you and I trust you, but help me to trust you. There's a gap in there. And see, Sometimes we think that, oh, well, I don't really truly trust God, so I must not really love God. I don't think I really have a relationship with him. No, that's not the case. That is, that is, that is your humanistic side. But see, the Bible says that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of the things that are not seen. So what are the things, what are you hoping for? What is that thing that you are believing God to pull through for? When you say, Lord... I believe, but help my unbelief. You are admitting to yourself and to God that there is a gap that he needs to fill. And Jesus answered the man really amazingly when he said, your son is healed, and, and, and the, the demon came out of him. And I bet you that man didn't doubt again after that because he said he's done it once. I just want to close with this. I was going to go to this other section, but I think I want to stay here. There is moves of God that are waiting to happen. And he's going to be he's wanting to use people. He's wanting to use people. I remember I, I said this months ago, a while back to the worship team before we started. Uh, it was about 2 Samuel, where David's men were giant killers. And we always, you know, we always know that, we always talk about David being the giant killer. And then it, later at the end of that chapter, it talks about that his, his men are giant killers. And I told the worship team, I said, guys, I don't ever want y'all to think that this is Josh Foz and his thing here. I don't ever want y'all to think that 
this is my thing and, and y'all are like following me kind of thing. Like this is, you know what I mean? I told him, I said, yes, David was the giant killer and he was the leader. He was the king and he was the one in front of everything. But his men had skills too. His men were so confident and they said, you know what? Go back home. We got this. There is an anointing, and I told, the, I told the teams, like, there is an anointing that each and every single one of you has that I don't have. The anointing that breaks the yoke. There's an anointing that you have that can break a yoke that my anointing can't. And God is wanting to use people today in the skills and the talents and the anointings that they have in their, in their field and whatever it is that they do. If you're a teacher, be a teacher and run in that skill set, run in that anointing. If you're in finances, if you're in banking, if you're in business, run in that mindset. Run with that anointing. Run with that skill set and serve God in the process. I always say that, I always love to say, if you want to be a scientist, I'll tell kids all day, if you want to be a scientist, go and be a scientist and a physicist and all these things and love God in the process and prove with science the existence of God. There is an anointing on each and every one of your lives that God wants to use that I don't have, that the person next to you doesn't have, only you have. There is a giant that you can kill that somebody else can't. There is a wave and a storm that you can just completely walk on and coast on the water through that others probably can't. There is a wall that you can break down that others probably can't. I believe that God is wanting to fill some gaps today. He's, he's going to come in and he's wanting to fill some gaps. Remember, it is okay to say, God, I believe you, but this unbelief part of me, you got to take care of this. You got you to gotta answer this because there's something here that isn't adding up. When we realize, just like the Israelites did, just like David knew, when we realize that the problem is bigger than we can handle, that's when we know that it's God's. Caleb and Joshua said, He's already given us that land. We just need to go get it. David told Goliath, just like the lion and the bear that the Lord helped me kill, that he delivered me from, he's going to deliver you into my hands today because the battle is the Lord's. Whatever it is you're going through, it already belongs to God. The battle that you're going through is already his. The promised land that he's already spoken to you, for you, is already guaranteed to you. You just need to go get it. The storm that you're riding out, remember that the boat isn't going to sink because he's on the boat. And if you have to, get out and walk it. Get out and walk that thing. Matter of fact, take your boogie board with you and just get on that water. Just ride them waves out. Mm. God, help us fill the gap today. Come on, let's stand to our feet today. Lord, I believe you're going to fill gaps today. I believe you're going to fill the gap of unbelief today. Lord, I believe that you are making a way for those 
who thought and believed that there was no way that they could ever get out of what they're in. I believe that you are making a way for healing when doctors said there was no healing. Jesus. Lord, I just speak breakthrough right now in Jesus' name. Breakthrough right now in Jesus' name. Lord, lack is not our problem because there is no lack in the Father. There is no lack in you, God. There is no lack in you, God. Jesus, Jesus. Lord, you said we were going to do greater things than what you did. So, Lord, I'm ready to see the crippled people walk again. I'm ready to see blind people seeing again. I'm ready to see deaf people hear again. I'm ready to see that. I'm ready to see breakthroughs for the people of God. Lord, I'm ready to see that it is no longer banks that are handing out money and loans, that it's going to be the people of God that are going to be doing it because of the abundance of overflow. Lord, I'm ready to see the church take their rightful place in this country again, God. Lord, your word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, I will hear from heaven and I will answer their prayers, God. Lord, we humble ourselves today and we say, God, we believe and we need you to fill the gap of our unbelief today, God. Come on, just begin to pray in the spirit for a second. He shut up. says testimony means do it again God do it again God do it again God I want to invite the prayer team to come up and if you need prayer today for whatever kind of breakthrough 
it is. I don't care if it's physical, financial, emotional, whatever it is. He's come through once and he's going to do it again. He's come through once and he'll do it again. For those of you that are watching on Facebook right now, I just speak the spirit of God to come and infiltrate that room that you're in. If you're listening while you're driving, if you're listening in your car, if you're listening in your living room, bedroom, whatever. Lord, that you move on their behalf. Lord, that healing comes right through that camera right here, right now. Prayer has no distance. Prayer has no distance. So we just speak that healing of God to come in into that room. Emotional healing to come through right there in Jesus' name. Physical healing, ailments in the body, pains to be gone right now in Jesus' name. Sickness and disease, whatever it is, you have to leave. I don't care where you came from. I don't care how you got there. I don't care what the doctor said. But you have to leave now in Jesus' name because you have the final word, God. It's already written and set in stone that your word says that by your stripes that we are healed, God. Not that we might be healed, not that we, if we say 10,000 different prayers that we'll be healed, Lord, that we are healed in Jesus' name. We declare that right now in Jesus' name. We command healing in Jesus' name. We don't, we don't suggest it, we don't recommend it. We command that in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. God is your proof, your salvation through Christ is your covenant, and the Bible is your confirmation. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. In Jesus' name. Listen, it's when the spies came in, I think the big difference was is what they saw. They all saw the same thing. Sometimes we don't see what Jesus sees. We have to do to Ephesians 6, having done all. Sometimes you just have to stand. And the word is so true, so good. That if he did it once, he set a precedence for it. He, he's not going to back up on his word. He knows all things will work together for good <clears throat> for those who are called according to his purpose. 
So my encouragement word to you is to, to conclude, Josh, a good word for the body of Christ today. What you see in the natural eyes, remember, to, to get back at the enemies, you got to remember to read the enemy's mail backwards because there's no truth in him. So what we see, Scripture says, blessed are those who have never seen, yet they believe. It says we stand. We stand with Joshua, stand with Caleb, and we say they may be giants there. We have already overcome. Listen, there has to be an enemy before you before you can overcome. The overcoming is part is it gets us in the book of Revelation, right? We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Amen. Stand with me this morning as we're dismissed. Thank you, Josh. Good word for the body of Christ in this hour. Don't forget, don't forget that there's also communion available over here. Uh, you can do it during service or after service. We'll never uh, interrupt anybody because I believe communion is, is supposed to be a daily thing because the disciples went from house to house daily and had bread and broke bread. So, Father, we give you praise and glory for another day in your house. It's better to have one day in your house than a thousand years elsewhere. Father, we give you praise today. Father, may your blessing be upon the soldiers this week, the body of Christ as we go forth into our workplaces. May your face be made to shine upon us this week. May your grace be so sufficient to help us get through what we need to walk through. So, Father, we thank you for another day that we can worship you and praise you. Father, this day is not concluded yet. And it won't conclude until you say it's all said and done. At midnight tonight, we'll start another new day. So, Father, I give you all glory and praise. And everybody said amen. Hug somebody before you leave this morning. We love and bless you. See you next Sunday. Dr. Sandy sends her love. Be here next Sunday. I'll let her preach.